we've got up next Dr. Aaron Grossman from the University of Cincinnati, and he will be giving a brief history of aneurysms and their treatment. Uh, hi, Dr. Grossman, welcome. Hi there, how are you? Thank you for having us. So uh, my name is Aaron Grossman, uh, and on behalf of the cerebrovascular team at UC Health, I want to thank uh, the uh, Tri-State Brain Aneurysm Foundation for having us. Um, originally, it was uh, supposed to be Dr. Sharani, Prestigiacomo, and myself, but unfortunately, Dr. Prestigiacomo was unable to join us today. Um, so instead, uh, it will be uh, Dr. Sharani, uh, Dr. Matt Smith, uh, who's one of our uh, neurocritical care and, and uh, endovascular fellows, uh, who will be presenting today. And we're going to be presenting as a team on uh, the history of uh, brain aneurysms and their treatment, as well as more modern techniques for brain aneurysm management. And then Dr. Smith will be talking for a while about uh, headaches uh, and aneurysms. So again, thank you for having us. So jumping right into a brief history of brain aneurysms and their treatment. The first descriptions of arterial aneurysms were by uh, Egyptian physician Imhotep in 2700 BC. And he wrote on the Ebers papyrus that there is a vessel swelling, a disorder I will treat. It is the vessels that cause it. It originates from an injury upon the vessel. Then thou shalt apply to it treatment with the knife. This knife is heated in fire. The bleeding will not be considerable. Well, thank God we're, we've, we've moved on from there. Where did the world aneurysm, where did the word aneurysm come from? This word is, originates in the Greek for, from aneurysma or a widening, which comes from uh, the stems anu or across and uris, which means broad. And the Greek physician Galen in the, two, 20, in the, in the second century described an artery having become dilated, the affection is called an aneurysm. It also arises from the wound of the same. When the skin lies over it, it is cicatrized or cut, but the wound in the artery remains and neither unites nor is blocked by flesh. We know now that what Galen was describing was a pseudoaneurysm in which there's a hole in the vessel, blood leaks out, and is covered by tissue, but that's different than the kinds of brain aneurysms that, that some of you have experienced in which uh, there's a weakness in a point of the wall of the blood vessel. And as Dr. Ringer likes to say, that that vessel gets pushed out like a balloon on the side of a garden hose. And it's all three layers of the vessel instead of just a hole in the vessel surrounded by tissue. The first description of subarachnoid hemorrhage was by Hippocrates in his book on aphorisms on apoplexy. He described that when a persons in good health are suddenly seized with pains in the head and straightway are laid down speechless and breathe with stertor, they die in seven days unless fever comes on. Again, we've come a long way. But this was some of the first uh, descriptions of, of, of subarachnoid, and this is how, this is what patient outcome was back in the day. The first illustration of a subarachnoid hemorrhage was in 1812 by a British physician named Shane. And as you can see in the picture, there's a, a thick layer of blood at the base of the brain that's surrounding the blood vessels of the brain. This picture has a piece of straw that marks a hole in the patient's carotid artery. So they recognized that there was something wrong with the blood vessels that caused this leakage of blood around the, around the base of the brain, but they didn't understand what caused the hole. It wasn't until the 1830s that subarachnoid hemorrhage was finally associated with ruptured brain aneurysms. And Richard Bright, another British physician, did, performed an autopsy of an 18-year-old man who, had, who died a week after a severe headache. Again, very morbid uh, uh, condition. Um, and he described a dissection that, dis he described that his dissection disclosed an effusion of blood to the extent of at least eight ounces 
over the left hemisphere of the brain. This on closer examination was found to have proceeded from the bursting of an aneurysmal sac about the size of a large pea or small horse bean. I also had to look up what a horse bean was. Uh, it's, it's like a fava bean. Um, so this was the earliest depiction of a ruptured cerebral aneurysm, this picture right here. When it comes to treating brain aneurysms, there's certainly been an evolution over the years. Initially blocking off the carotid artery uh, in the neck or head, then transitioning to treating the aneurysm itself, first by wrapping the dome and then clipping the neck of the aneurysm, until eventually we move towards endo endovascular techniques such as coiling and some of the more modern devices that Dr. Sharani is going to describe. So we'll go through this history a little. The very first approaches to blocking off an aneurysm included external compression of the carotid artery in the neck. Can you imagine having devices like this wrapped around your neck, pressing on your carotid artery? How about this one, where you lie on this block, put your neck in the little cradle, and then the, the, um, the compression device is pressed down upon your neck to, uh, to compress the carotid artery over time. And here you see a nurse who's, uh, who is um, watching the timing of that carotid artery compression. And you'll notice that the patient is compressing it with, with uh, his or her opposite hand so that when the compression becomes too, too, uh, too severe or, or for too long and their hand get weak, gets weak from on the opposite side of their body, they might give up that, that pressure uh, and, and restore blood flow. So it wasn't intended to be a, 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 a stroke a, a situation that, that where you give yourself a stroke, but just slowly compressing the carotid over time to, uh, to, to reduce the flow into the aneurysm above it. They could block off the carotid artery in the neck with surgery too. Here's one way to sew the artery together so that over time th there's, there's uh, no blood flow that, that occurs in the blood vessel. Here you take uh, a, a strip of fascia or soft tissue from the body, wrap it around the aneurysm or around the carotid and tie it shut. And then they started to use devices like a little band that you wrap around the, aneur around the carotid and fold over on itself, the Matas band. The neff clamp, which is basically two plates that are tied together with rubber band on one side, you tie them together with cat gut on the other and put the rubber bands around and the artery is crushed between the two plates. Or this thing called the Silverstone, Silverstone clamp, where you basically put something around the bottom of the artery and then tie this and then, and then clamp down on the artery itself. Or you could, what, as, as, uh, brain surgical techniques uh, improved. They found that they could try to that they could start to block off the carotid artery in the head. Um, and and you see I don't know if you can see the mouse, but uh, numbers two and three uh, reflect uh, the the blocking off of that carotid artery in the head. Some of the first descriptions of this. Uh, were in, in the setting uh, not of a brain aneurysm uh, off the carotid, but of uh, an abnormal connection between the carotid and uh, the veins around the carotid that, uh, that, that caused uh, swelling of the eye called a carotid cavernous fistula. And that uh, occurred typically after trauma. Uh, and on the right side, you can see at the inset and, and the red arrow, a small, uh, a small uh, thread that was wrapped around the carotid artery right in, in the brain, uh, and then that, that uh, thread was, was tightened uh, to block off the carotid inside the head. But blocking off the carotid carried about a 40 to 50% mortality rate. And so uh, this, as surgical techniques improved, uh, this, this approach was abandoned in favor of, of, of treating the aneurysm directly. So in this situation, uh, uh, the first uh, person to actually perform a direct treatment of the aneurysm, uh, of a brain aneurysm, was, a Brit was Britain's first full-time neurosurgeon named Norman Dott. And in 1931, 
uh, he, he performed a first wrapping of, of the aneurysm dome. They were accustomed, as he says, to deal successfully with quite formidable intracranial hemorrhages during operations by applying to the bleeding point a fragment of fresh muscle, which formed a secure scaffolding for the clot and became organized into fibrous tissue with it. So why not expose a bleeding aneurysm and deal with it after this fashion? Over time, as, uh, as technology improved, uh, surgeons began to clip the neck of the aneurysm instead of just wrap it uh, with, with uh, muscle. And the first clipping was performed uh, by Dr. Walter Dandy, who was a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And in the picture on the right, at the uh, top red arrow, you can see uh, the aneurysm uh, exposed by surgery and the retractor pulling the brain aside to, to expose that. And then on the little red arrow in the bottom, you can see a small clip across the neck of the aneurysm. And he describes that the small neck of the aneurysm afforded an easy surgical attack. An ordinary flat silver clip was placed over the neck of the sac, tightly compressed. The clip was flush with the wall of the artery. And then as a little farther down, uh, once, once they um, clotted off the artery, it shriveled to a thin shred of tissue. Um, and then it ceased, it became softer and it ceased to pulsate. So you've basically, as Dr. Hodes described, uh, you've basically uh, blocked off that artery from the uh, cerebrovascular circulation, uh, thus uh, preventing it from rupturing again. As technology evolved, uh, so did the clips. These initial clamps that, uh, that might have been applied up in the top left corner, the Crutchfield clamp, then there was one that, uh, that compressed uh, um, on, uh, with, with uh, some forceps, and then you could open it back up again by, by pinching the back. Dr. Mayfield had his own clip uh, that, that he published uh, about in 1971. But the winner of the technology uh, race uh, to a successful clip was Dr. Yassergill. And this is the clip that he, uh, he developed. Um, with the forceps, uh, as you squeeze them, it opens up uh, the clip uh, here. Uh, and here's an inset. Uh, as, you pinch, um, as you pinch the, the, the back of the clip, the fulcrum uh, opens up the, um, the, 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 the clip and you can place it on the aneurysm or reposition it until you have the perfect uh, clip placement. And that way, microsurgical clipping became the mainstay of aneurysm therapy. Over time, endovascular techniques have, have, have emerged, and we've talked a lot about those over the years at this, at this, uh, at this um, symposium. Um, and, and those were permitted by improvements in X-ray imaging, uh, which allowed for, for angiography or taking pictures of the blood vessels. Egas Moniz was a Portuguese physician who actually won the Nobel Prize for some of this work. And here's one of the early angiograms that you can see. At that time, they, they couldn't subtract the X-ray of the skull. And so you had the X-ray of the skull and the black uh, contrast dye in the blood vessels. But now you can subtract the X-ray of the skull with the computers that are associated with the modern X-ray machines. And all you see is the black blood vessels on a white background. So it makes it much, much easier to see what uh, the anatomy. If you can see the aneurysm, maybe you can treat it from inside the blood vessel. So some of the first approaches to this were these latex balloons that were, uh, that were allowed to, uh, to float into the aneurysm, sometimes with the help of a second balloon, were inflated and then detached. And those balloons stayed there uh, and blocked off the aneurysm. Now, some surgeons were placing tiny wires directly into the aneurysms. And you can see on the picture on the left, uh, they, they could poke a hole into the aneurysm uh, and, and thread wires into the aneurysm through that poked hole until the aneurysm was completely filled by wires. And this led to the question of why couldn't these wires be placed from within the parent vessel as such? So a, a, a small wire to guide your catheter going into the aneurysm itself that wire comes out, these coils come in, as we've talked about uh, over the years in, in, in this symposium, and the coils eventually fill up the brain aneurysm. So why couldn't we do that? Well, coil technology had to improve as well. So this is Caesar Gianturco. 
Dr. Jean Turco was an Italian physician uh, who uh, who moved to uh, to start who moved to the United States and started a clinic in uh, in Champaign, Illinois, and uh, and he invented these wire coils that were coated with Dacron fiber tufts. And they were great for work in the in the body and the peripheral vasculature, but they were far too stiff for use in the brain. And here you see Dr. Gian Turco uh, at his uh, at his little uh, tinkering laboratory in his basement. And I know it's his basement because Dr. Gian Turco was my next door neighbor. It turns out when I was growing up, and I had no idea that he was uh, one of the grandfathers of the field that 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 I and so many others would go into. Uh, but this was Caesar Gian Turco. He lived until his 90s. He would mow his lawn next to our house in his three-piece suit on his riding mower. And every so often when we'd go over to bring him and his wife cookies, he'd bring us downstairs uh, to, into his lab and show us the kinds of things he was working on. It was amazing. He was a, just a, the kindest, kindest man. And and uh, his, his coils were used for many, many years to block off structures and blood vessels. Over time, platinum coils became soft enough to use in the brain, but they were unable to control their detachment initially until Dr. Guglielmi developed a platinum coil that could be attached by passing electric current through the coil. And this permitted deployment uh, of the coil, including reversing, revising the placement of that coil before actually detaching it. So you could put it in, if it didn't fit nicely, if there was a loop hanging out, you could pull it back get it back in until you had the perfect positioning of the coil, and only then would you, uh, would you uh, release it with th that electrical uh, current. Whereas previously, you pushed them out through your catheter, and once they were out, they were out wherever they landed. So this was a revolutionary uh, uh, development in the treatment of brain aneurysms. And these advances in technology have enabled us to successfully treat brain aneurysms like this one. It's very similar to the pictures that Dr. Hody showed uh, where, where the aneurysm is, is treated with coils. Uh, you don't see the aneurysm neck anymore. And then over time, uh, that aneurysm is completely blocked off and, and, uh, and prevented from rupturing again. So at this time, I'll turn the, uh, the reins over to Dr. Sharani, uh, who will tell us about recent uh, technological advances in aneurysm therapy. Thank you very much.